faire une conférence qui sera faite en anglais. Je vais faire la, la présentation de, du conférencier en français, puis après, je vous céderai la parole. Euh, il nous avisait là, il y a quelques minutes que malheureusement, son français n'est pas assez bon pour qu'il prenne des, des questions dans cette langue, mais euh, bon, c'est si vous n'êtes pas à l'aise non plus de poser des questions à la fin de sa conférence là, en anglais, vous pouvez toujours euh, les poser en français et on s'organisera pour euh, les traduire le plus adéquatement et euh, précisément possible. Euh, donc aujourd'hui, on a le plaisir de recevoir Erantal pour une, une conférence. Euh, Erantal vient tout juste d'obtenir une chaire de recherche du Canada sur euh, l'éthique euh, des données. Il est professeur de philosophie au département de philosophie de l'Université McGill depuis 2016 et son parcours universitaire est passé par les universités de Tel Aviv, de Toronto, Cambridge, entre autres. Il travaille sur des questions épistémiques et éthiques de, de la collecte de données, de l'analyse et de l'utilisation des données en sciences. Il a aussi travaillé sur la philosophie des de la mesure en sciences. Euh, et aujourd'hui, il nous présente, au fond, euh, je ne sais pas dans, dans quel degré de détail il va aller, mais euh, de manière un peu générale, le, le programme de recherche de la chaire de recherche qu'il a obtenu tout récemment. Donc, euh, le titre de sa conférence, c'est « Responsible Measurement and the Ethics of Big Data euh, ». Je le laisse prendre la parole pour... Euh, euh, je ne sais pas combien de temps il a, il a prévu exactement, mais entre 30 et 40 minutes, disons, et puis par la suite suivra une petite période de questions et de discussions. Je vous rappelle que la conférence est enregistrée, ça va être déposé sur euh, notre euh, je sais pas, site internet, YouTube, bref, vous, vous arriverez à trouver euh, cette euh, conférence et son enregistrement par la suite. Euh, donc, euh, si vous voulez euh, fermer vos caméras, euh, vous êtes évidemment libre de le faire et il semblerait que c'est mieux pour l'environnement. Donc, euh, je laisse la parole à, à Erenthal et je vous souhaite une bonne conférence. Your thank turn. you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, and, and thanks everyone at CERST, uh, Mathieu and, and the rest of the team for inviting me here. I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here and, uh, and thanks very much for everyone uh, who is uh, here for this talk. Uh, what I'm about to present to you is, uh, uh, is very much work in progress. Um, I'll be testing some new ideas on you as part of a, a recent project I, I just uh, uh, started on uh, the relationship between uh, measurement and uh, big data, specifically the ethics of big data and machine learning. Um, and um, Uh, part of what I'm trying to, to achieve through this project, as you can see, as you will be able to see shortly, is uh, an understanding of how concepts from philosophy of measurement and philosophy of science uh, can help us um, uh, get a better handle on um, the ethical problems that arise from the collection, uh, management and use of big data, and how we may be able to tackle uh, such problems. Uh, Today, uh, there'll be roughly four topics I want to cover. First, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about machine learning and health disparities, the use of machine learning and health applications. Um, then I'll go on to discuss the philosophy of measurement, uh, why I think it's relevant to this uh, topic, um, and how we might think of some machine learning algorithms as measuring instruments. Uh, then I will Uh, propose, given in, in light of the, the literature on the philosophy of measurement, I will propose uh, more refined concepts of accuracy and error that I think would be useful uh, for the field of machine learning. Um, and I'll, uh, in, the, in the end, tie them back to the idea of responsible measurement and how uh, these refined concepts of accuracy and error could help uh, reduce health disparities that arise through the use of machine learning in healthcare. Um, let's see. Okay. So machine learning um, uh, methods are uh, a family of statistical methods that rely on uh, high volumes of data and intensive computational power 
uh, they're increasingly used for, uh, for clinical risk prediction. Um, and in this role, they, uh, they guide clinical decision-making in a var variety of ways. Uh, for, for example, concerning diagnosis, treatment, um, um, medical resource allocation, such as the allocation of ICU beds. Uh, in this example, uh, deep, deep neural networks assess the risk of melanoma and other forms of risk ca cancer. Uh, there, these algorithms are trained on large data sets of images of skin lesions, such as the International Skin Imaging Collaboration. And you can see an excerpt from that, that database here. Uh, these data sets contain, uh, uh, as you can see, lots of images, but they also concern, con contain uh, fields that are called labels. Um, for example, whether a pathologist or a dermatologist deemed the mole uh, malignant or benign. Now, once the model is trained to reproduce uh, or to approximately reproduce these labels, it can be used to evaluate risk for new patients based on their images of, of their skin lesions. Uh, but as you can see from the titles of, of these two articles I, uh, I placed here, uh, several studies suggest that these algorithms carry the risk of introducing or exacerbating health disparities for disad disadvantaged groups. Uh, for example, the melanoma detecting algorithm may make more classification errors for dark skin patients than for light skin ones. Um, why, why is this happening? Why do we have uh, these, these health disparities? Um, there are a few likely causes. Um, one is that the training data reflects disparities that already exist in the healthcare system. Disparities in healthcare access, in healthcare utilization, uh, and, and healthcare quality that arise from, uh, from var various social causes, such as structural forms of racism. Uh, if, if a certain group of, uh, of patients um, are, are underdiagnosed or are diagnosed correctly uh, in a low, at, a, at a lower rate, this will show up in the data and this will create bi bias in the, in the data. Um, also, underrepresentation of uh, women, ethnic minorities, and other uh, uh, demographic groups, such as the elderly, in clinical data sets is a problem. The, these algorithms uh, train better the more data they have. And if a, a certain demographic group is, uh, is not very present in the data, patterns in data that are uh, unique to it uh, will, uh, will not be uh, detected with the same accuracy. And another, and these are not by any, by any stretch the only uh, causes, but a third cause is the use of biased or misspecified proxy outcomes. So often the data um, in, these, in, in these data sets, these training data sets, um, contain fields like the length of hospital stay. Um, but it's, uh, it's plausible that uh, someone with uh, more modest financial means would have uh, ten, people like that would tend to have uh, shorter hospital stays because their, uh, say, their insurance coverage um, uh, isn't isn't as comprehensive, um, and this this will show up as if as if these people are their health is better off while in fact uh, the data is biased. So these are just a few of the of the likely causes for health disparities that arise through the use of these tools. Um, now, one um, body of literature that tries to um, address these challenges uh, is called algorithmic fairness. And there are a lot of different approaches within algorithmic fairness. But the general idea is to use the tools of probability theory, specifically conditional probabilities, to um, equalize um, the error rates between different groups. Um, uh, for example, um, one way is to redistribute uh, the, the false positive and false negative such that, uh, say, uh, blacks and whites have the same rate of false positive or, or, and or false negatives uh, that arise from a diagnostic tool. And uh, the bad news from this literature is that when you do that, when you, uh, when you make sure that different demographic groups or different protected groups have the same rate of error, uh, a diagnostic error, say, from the algorithm, you degrade the overall accuracy. So everyone will, will fare worse uh, 
uh, in terms of the accuracy the algorithm uh, gives you. Uh, for example, here uh, in this graph, you see um, the results of predicting 30 day readmission, the, the, uh, the, the chance that someone will be readmitted uh, to hospital uh, after uh, 30 days after their release. Uh, this is, this is uh, based on data from nearly 200,000 patients from Stanford hospitals. And what you see in this graph, uh, the, uh, the Y axis, let me, do this fancy laser thing. Uh, the y-axis is the is the accuracy of the algorithm, uh, and here you see what happens before you apply the you, you redistribute the the error rates. You see that the uh, the accuracy rate, the rate of of uh, uh, false negatives and uh, false positives for uh, the black population. Uh, the, the rate of, of false uh, results is higher, which meaning, mean, means that the accuracy is lower for this group. Um, but after you equalize their odds, and this x-axis is what happens when you increase the penalty on the model uh, for, for uh, producing uh, disparate results, as you equalize the odds of um, errors across these different groups, the accuracy for all of these groups uh, declines. Uh, there's a kind of trade-off, um, according to this literature, between fairness and accuracy. Um, now, there are various ways to respond to these claims about fairness and accuracy. One, one of them is to uh, go back and ask, well, what do you mean by fairness? Um, uh, there are various theories of distributive justice for healthcare, and really what we're interested here when we talk about fairness is justice. Um, utilitarianism uh, is one way to approach um, distributive justice questions. Uh, this is when we want to maximize overall health or uh, overall, overall health-related quality of life or minimize overall burden of disease. Um, and and um, various measures uh, like uh, Quality adjusted life years, or qualies, or disability adjusted life years, dollies, are used to, to make these kinds of utilitarian uh, type calculations. Another approach uh, that, is, um, um, that is most identified with Mo Norman Daniels, who, who uh, developed Rolls' theory of uh, justice, is fair equality of opportunity. Here, the goal is to improve access to healthcare for those who are, who are worst off. Uh, there are various um, views about uh, distributive justice that could underwrite um, this, this claim. I'm not going to go into the differences between you know, egalitarian, prioritarian, or sufficientarian uh, views of, of, uh, of distributive justice. Um, but this is, this is just to give you an idea of, of what, uh, what underlies this kind of um, consideration. And the third way of approaching distributive justice is the capability approach. Um, that is, of course, identified with uh, Amartya Sen's work and Martha Nussbaum. Uh, and here you equalize capability uh, or the set of potential combinations of functionings that are available to an individual. So healthcare becomes uh, a way to uh, increase uh, one's capability, a kind, of, uh, a kind of resource, a kind of good um, that is uh, instrumental in, uh, in, in equalizing capability. Now, what I want you to remember from this slide is the fact that it doesn't really matter which theory uh, you use uh, for this talk, um, because first, the algorithm, the algorithmic fairness uh, literature, uh, for the very large, for the for most part, simply ignores these debates. Um, um, the and this is a problem. The algorithmic fairness literature should engage in these debates. Um, otherwise, it risks just having very uh, superficial uh, notions of fairness. And I think in, indeed it does have superficial notions of, of uh, fairness. Um, but in this talk, I'm going to put all of this aside and tackle it from a different perspective, which is uh, what, what about accuracy? Remember in the previous slide, we said that accuracy and fairness trade off against each other. And we thought we have had a pretty straightforward idea of accuracy. It's the, the rate of, uh, 
uh, it's related inversely to the rate of errors, uh, false positives and false negatives. Um, and it's easy to just ask, well, what is fairness and forget to ask what is accuracy? Today, I'm going to um, first try to convince you that machine learning algorithms, specifically what I call locating algorithms, uh, share a common inferential structure with measuring instruments, things like clocks, balances, uh, thermometers. Uh, these uh, instruments share uh, important epistemic aims and justification structures in common with, uh, with the kind of uh, diagnostic machine learning tools that I, that I just talked about. Uh, the second, second thing I'll argue is that um, the field of machine learning currently operates under overly naive concepts of accuracy and error. So it's not just fairness, the concept of fairness we should be worried about, um, but it's also the concept of accuracy and error uh, that is too naive. And um, once we tap into the resources of, of metrology, the science of measurement uh, and the philosophy of measurement, we can, uh, we can uh, have a, a better idea of what accuracy and error uh, could be um, in a way that I think benefit, would benefit the study of machine learning. And the third thing I want to convince you of today is that this all really matters to fairness in the end. Uh, fairness and justice uh, would, would benefit from adopting um, more refined concepts of accuracy and error. So under this, these refined concepts, um, an increase in accuracy would also lead to an increase of in fairness. So in a way, this, uh, this trade-off that the algorithmic fairness literature talks about between fairness and, and accuracy um, is, a, uh, is an artifact of the naive way in which machine learning theorists for the most part think about accuracy. A more refined way to think about accuracy would, uh, would make accuracy and fairness uh, be a, a largely in harmony with each other. Okay, so let me say something about the philosophy of measurement. Uh, this is a field I've been working on for uh, uh, quite a bit of time. Uh, it's a, um, it's a field, a subfield of philosophy of science that until uh, the late 20th century uh, received relatively uh, little attention. Um, uh, and there are, there are exceptions that I'm happy to, to discuss, but uh, since uh, about two decades ago, there's been a a huge flourishing of, of interest in measurement within philosophy. And you can see some of the book titles um, uh, that came out. Uh, Hassock Chang's Inventing Temperature uh, is, is very famous for the, the detailed philosophical and historical analysis of uh, one specific measurand uh, temperature. Uh, so when I say measurand, I mean the, the variable being measured. Uh, but there's also been really interesting work about the um, notions of, um, of accuracy, calibration, measurement standardization in other fields, such as uh, uh, well-being measurement, uh, Alexandrova's book from 2017, uh, the measurement in medicine, an edited volume by Leah McClymans from 2017, um, and there are others. Now, what does this literature tell us about uh, what it is to measure? And and the kind of uh, social and, and ethical values that are involved in measuring. Uh, let's start with a really simple example. Here's a caliper. A caliper uh, is meant to measure the, the size, the diameter of, of um, objects that are placed be between its jaws. Uh, you look at this uh, little readout and uh, you look at the number that shows up there and that's supposed to tell you how, uh, how long is, is the diameter of the workpiece? Uh, at first, this seems completely mundane and, uh, and not complicated, but if you want to measure well, uh, you can't just assume that the number that shows up on the readout is, uh, is, is a, a, a transparent and direct um, representation of, of the diameter. And that's because there are all sorts of things that uh, mediate the relationship between the, the diameter and the readout, all sorts of extraneous uh, influences um, that intervene 
on the, on the relationship between the diameter and the readout. So what metrologists, scientists who are special specialists in measurement do is they create an abstract model of their, the measurement process. Here, up here, you see the diameter. This is what we want to measure. And down here, you see the indication. That's what we observe. And in between, various variables uh, enter into this relationship, such as the temperature of the workpiece or the roughness of the contact between the, the workpiece and the leg, uh, or the aber error, which is the wiggle room uh, of the leg, and so on. Um, what metrologists do with this information, once they construct a, a theoretical model of the measurement process, and this is, a, of course, a, a kind of toy model, they get, they get much more complicated than this. Um, they construct a calibration function. That's a function that takes uh, the indication of the instrument, as well as all these other influencing factors. And uh, the, the function um, returns the, the outcome. Measurement outcome is our best estimate of, um, of what we want to measure, in this case, the diameter. Now, there are a few things to notice here uh, uh, with respect to this calibration function. One is that uh, this function is a model-based prediction. We've just created a, a theoretical statistical model of the process of measurement and used it to predict a function about the behavior of the measuring system. What, would, what will the, the, uh, the caliper behave like when we uh, put a certain object between its jaws? Um, second thing to note is that this O, this measurement outcome, uh, is a model-based predictor of instrument indications or of patterns in instrument indications under some idealized theoretical and statistical assumptions. To, to get to this function, we had to make some idealizing assumptions about how the process works. Um, what we're interested in, in the end, uh, if you can think of it about, about the, the kind of the aim of measurement as uh, assessing the diameter uh, that a caliper would measure under ideal conditions when no temperature or roughness or wiggle error uh, are present. That's the ideal. Uh, so measurement accuracy under this view, uh, which I call the model-based account, um, is the predictive accuracy of an idealized model of the measurement process. Measurement involves a lot of prediction. Uh, and measurement accuracy is a kind of predictive accuracy. We don't notice it when we measure it, when we use instruments to measure, because the metrologists who designed the instrument already did all those predictions for us. And we feel like we can just read the results from the display. But in fact, uh, the, the inferential structure uh, involves modeling and prediction as, as core uh, necessary components of, uh, of the inference from an indication to an outcome. Okay, so why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this because um, there's a, a subset of uh, machine learning algorithms, I'm gonna call them locating algorithms, um, that, um, that I think um, have similar inferential structure and epistemic aims to um, measuring instruments. Uh, these are machine learning algorithms that rely on empirical input to locate an entity on a parameter space. Just like you um, locate the, that circular workpiece on the abstract parameter space of length, you, you find out what length it has or what diameter it has. Um, and by doing so, you locate it on a, on a one dimensional abstract parameter space. A diagnosis also locates you uh, on an abstract parameter space, minimally the parameter space of a, of a um, binary variable, um, um, the, wh whether or not you, you are, you're likely to have skin cancer. Um, moreover, uh, uh, this is not just classification. Um, machine learning algorithms are typically used to, uh, to rank and score. Think of credit scores or uh, the rankings of your, um, of, of your uh, um, of potential um, uh, candidates for, for a job. Um, machine learning algorithms are used for a variety of uh, purposes 
that involve classifying, ranking, and scoring humans. Uh, uh, so it's not just your likelihood of having an illness, it's also um, your likelihood of defaulting on a lo loan um, or su succeeding at a job or, or failing to appear in court that will be um, essential to uh, decision-making uh, such as whether your loan will be approved, whether your CV will make it to a human uh, assessor, or whether your bail uh, application will be uh, approved. And these are all real world application that, applications that machine learning is uh, currently being used for. Um, not all machine le uh, learning algorithms are locating algorithms. Uh, some are generative. Uh, they create, say, text or images. So I'm not including those in my definition of uh, locating algorithms. Locating algorithms rely on what's called discriminative models. Okay, so how, how are they like measuring instruments? You probably already have a feel of how they're similar, but let's make it uh, more uh, uh, precise. First, uh, they locate an entity on a parameter space, Bas van Fassen, um, takes this function to be a, an essential function of measurement. Um, and I agree, um, both, uh, both clocks, thermometers and balances and, and these locating um, algorithms uh, have that same, uh, have that thing in common, locating an entity on parameter space. But this is not where things end. In both cases, they rely on statistical models to predict patterns in the data, as we've seen with the caliper. In both cases, the model is constructed by reference to some known parameter value. Uh, we call them labels in the case of supervised machine learning or uh, standards, measurement standards in the case of measurement. But in both cases, we have some known parameter values to go by. And today I'm not talking, I'm not gonna talk about unsupervised machine learning. Uh, finally, and importantly, the outputs of uh, machine learning algorithms are commonly used as evidence for decision-making. Um, we use the, the, the results of, um, of credit scores to make decisions about loans. We use the results of uh, risk recidivism scores um, to make uh, decisions about um, uh, bail and sentencing in the, in the criminal justice system. So although we call the results predictions, in fact, uh, they are, we use them as evidence. Okay. Let's go back to measure, measurement and, and look at a slightly more complicated example. Uh, this is a clock. Uh, it doesn't look like a normal clock. Uh, it's one of the most accurate clocks in the world. Uh, it's called NIST F1 and it's a cesium fountain clock. It's a kind of atomic clock uh, that is in a, in a basement uh, in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, one of two uh, primary frequency standards that, uh, that uh, calibrate all other clocks in the United States um, and, and many others uh, around the world. So how does it work and how accurate is it? Inside this machine are cesium atoms um, that undergo an energy uh, transition and quantum mechanics tells us that this energy transition is associated with a specific frequency. So if you can measure that frequency, uh, you have a very stable uh, uh, frequency that, um, that you can then um, calibrate your, um, your clocks to. Um, but the problem is that just like with the caliper case, uh, the, uh, the atoms, the cesium atoms inside this complicated machine are not in an ideal state. All sorts of things disturb them. Here's a list. Uh, gravitational redshift is the effect of uh, gravitation. Uh, uh, the second row has to do with um, uh, the effects of magnetic fields. Uh, the third uh, row in this table has to do with temperature. The fourth with collisions between atoms. So all these different uh, uh, extraneous effects make the frequency that's actually recorded from these atoms different from the frequency that would be recorded under ideal conditions when these atoms are just floating in um, an empty space without any perturbations. And that's what we really want. We want to measure that, but that's impossible. No atoms float in space without any perturbations uh, and, and no uh, ambient fields. And that's why metrologists 
construct this kind of table. This table is called an uncertainty budget. When they want to know how accurate this clock is, they figure out uh, the, the difference, the error, um, between the actual state of the atom and the ideal state uh, based on an estimation on the, of the extraneous effect size under each row. This is the first, uh, this is the second column here called magnitude. And uh, they also associate, uh, um, evaluate the uncertainty of their own estimation of the error. And that's the last column, the uncertainty. Now, here's the thing. If you look closely, and I've magnified it for you, the magnitudes of, of some of these errors are much, much larger than the total uncertainty of the clock. Uh, in other words, the error is much larger, larger than, uh, than the uncertainty. What's going on? Uh, what metrologists care about is not uh, the rate of this specific clock. What they care about is the ideal cesium frequency that they can infer from the ticks of this specific clock. In other words, they care not about the difference, but about the predictability of the difference between the concrete and the ideal. The they, they care about the total uncertainty with which they can predict the difference between the actual ticks of the clock and the ideal. And that's the accuracy of the clock. The accuracy of the clock is actually this, this number, the total uncertainty. Uh, well, that's the, the accuracy is inversely related to this number. Okay, um, let's go back to machine learning. Uh, how do they evaluate accuracy? If you look at the skin cancer example, uh, a very highly cited paper in Nature uh, that announced the age of machine learning um, um, uh, based diagnosis, uh, calculated the, uh, the, the accuracy of a, a melanoma um, diagnostic machine learning algorithm by comparing the, it, by comparing the predictions of the algorithm to the uh, diagnoses given by uh, dermatologists, the exper experts um, in the field. And uh, from this graph, uh, you see that they've, they've achieved phenomenal results. Um, uh, sensitivity here is the, the true positive rate and speci specificity is the true negative rate. And the algorithm is performing uh, e extremely close to one uh, when you trade off these two variables against each other. Right? So a, a, perfect al a perfect diagnostic algorithm would, would be completely square. And this one is just almost completely square. So the area under this curve uh, is almost one. It's 0 .0, 0 0.96. That sounds great. Uh, but there's one problem. And the problem is that uh, dermatologists um, uh, are known to detect skin cancer less reliably uh, and significantly at a later stage uh, in African-Americans relative to, to Caucasians. So when you compare your accuracy relative to the dermatologist's uh, diagnosis, you're in fact um, 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 uh, not taking these differences into uh, account. You are uh, simply trying to reproduce the biased estimates that, that um, dermatologists are already producing. Uh, one may think, well, that's all I need. All I need to show reliability is to reproduce what the experts say. Um, but uh, this way of assessing uh, accuracy makes it, um, uh, ma makes it difficult to, um, to understand uh, what we actually want to measure. We don't want to actually measure dermatologists' uh, um, uh, rate of, of uh, diagnosis. What we want to, to measure is uh, whether or not this patient has, in fact, skin cancer. Um, so there's a, a problem with um, a misspecification of, of the task, of the target um, of, the, of the prediction. Um, this problem is known as the problem of proxies or sometimes called label bias. Um, the labels that, that is, are used in the data come from dermatologists, but those labels are um, in some senses unreliable indicators 
of what we really care about, which is whether someone has skin cancer or not. To drive the point home, let's make a kind of comparison between measuring instruments and locating algorithms. Uh, measuring instruments interact with a concrete object, such as an atom or a workpiece. Uh, machine learning locating algorithms also interact, although not directly or physically, but they interact with objects indirectly through the data we collect about them. Uh, measuring instruments produce indications. Um, locating algorithms produce what we call predictions, classifications or scores. And uh, in the case of a measuring instrument, we use the indications to infer measurement outcomes. Um, and in the case of locating algorithms, we use the prediction to also to infer values of some target variable. So far, so good. But here comes the difference. Um, but we would measure under ideal conditions. Whereas in most cases, uh, the error, errors reported in the, uh, when computer scientists you know, publish their, their, their error rates, uh, what they report in the case of machine learning is just the mismatch between the predictions and their labels. Uh, and similarly, while in, um, in the case of measurement, accuracy is determined by the total uncertainty associated with predicting error. So accuracy is the, um, related to um, how well we can predict the, the difference between the concrete instrument and the ideal measurement process. In the case of locating algorithms, what is commonly uh, reported is, is, sim is simply uh, the absence of error. Accuracy is simply the absence of error, uh, namely the, the rate of matches between predictions and labels. And there's no uh, uh, attempt to try to uh, um, even, even um, theorize about an ideal scenario, what, what an ideal algorithm would, would, um, would produce. So I take issue with these concepts of accuracy and error. Um, OK, um, so what's the problem? Why not just stay with these limited concepts of accuracy and error? First, uh, I already mentioned that labels are proxies. They're not usually representative of, of the target variable. Uh, for example, mortality rate is often an, an inaccurate proxy of uh, benefit of treatment. Uh, uh, patients that are perceived to be at high risk would, would uh, get priority of care. Uh, which would lead them to, uh, to have lower mortality uh, rates. And this is something that uh, Brian Christian uh, beautifully describes in his book, The Alignment, Pro uh, the Alignment Problem. Um, so high-risk patients um, could, could actually have the label of, uh, of having lower mortality rate and, and be denied resources such as ICU beds um, if we if we don't examine the labels and realize that our labels are biased. Other, uh, other limitations involve um, the, the, the fact that when you implement an algorithm, you're already in, intervening in the, in the social system that the algorithm is part of. Um, uh, there is a variety, there's, there's lots of examples of, of self-fulfilling prophecies that happen when you uh, say, try to use an algorithm to predict which neighborhoods have higher crime rates by using arrest data, and then send more police officers to that area uh, who make more arrests, um, and you see how this, this will snowball. Uh, alert fatigue is the uh, phenomenon of uh, clinicians dismissing alerts that are deemed to be uh, false positives. Um, so trying to increase the false positive rate uh, leads to the exact opposite uh, 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 effect than the intended one. And various attempts to game the system. Um, other limitations of these uh, concepts of error and accuracy um, are that equalizing error rates may have little to do with fairness. If your labels are already biased, uh, then reproducing them has dubious um, ethical values. Um, 
why we pre why we reproduce the racially biased diagnost diagnostic um, uh, diagnoses of of physicians um, if uh, uh, if they are uh, racially biased? Why try to um, to reproduce those? Uh, so the fact that we're we're trying to get to minimize the error rate with respect to um, racially biased uh, uh, labels, uh, that's not that's going to that's not going to help us to get more fairness. And um, the the last two limitations have to do with uh, with the way we conceptualize the target variable. If we just stick with what the labels and the data tell us, we are we don't even start to deliberate uh, about what we want to measure. In fact. In fact, what we, what we do is we presuppose a kind of extreme operationalism where the target is whatever the label is. Um, but that is problematic for the reasons I've just uh, stated. Okay, so what, what do I think we need to do? Um, I think we need to um, uh, at least try to adopt um, more refined notions of accuracy and error. And, and here I, um, I, um, I specified what I think these would be in analogy with a, with a measurement case. Now, I want to note that I'm not arguing here that locating algorithms or machine learning, uh, that they are measuring instruments. Uh, in a way, I don't really care if you, classifies them as, if you classify them as measurement or not. Uh, my claim is much more modest. Um, my claim is simply that there is enough similarity epistemically between these two that it may be beneficial to look at the methodology of, of evaluating accuracy and error, which has a much longer and richer history in measurement than it does in the nation, nascent field of machine learning, uh, that, it, that it, it may be worthwhile to do this uh, and, and see what the benefits may be. Um, so it's, it's a purely methodological, not metaphysical uh, claim. Um, so my, my proposal is to think of error in machine learning as the difference between the predictions of the algorithm and the predictions of an ideal algorithm. And similarly, accuracy is no longer the inverse of, of error. It's rather determined by the total uncertainty associated with predicting error. So the error could be large. Uh, and the accuracy could be large as well if we can predict the error very accurately. Um, what we need to know is, uh, uh, we, we need to determine what the ideal case would be. So even when the algorithm itself is very far from the ideal because the data is biased, if we know how to systematically correct the predictions and, uh, and our systematic corrections are accurate, then overall the accuracy would be high. And this is where I propose a new notion of accuracy for machine learning, uh, which I call instant. Uh, sorry, the instance accuracy is is the is the standard uh, way. Uh, the probability that the prediction is just equal to the target variable as given by the label. What I propose is what I call process accuracy, which is the probability that this entire complex of algorithm and uh, stakeholders, users. Uh, patients, in the case of healthcare, that this entire system will approximate an ideal use case within some uh, margin. And when I talk about ideal use case, I mean a scenario in which both the instance accuracy of the algorithm, how, how well it reproduces its labels, and the benefits to stakeholders reach an optimal equilibrium and reach it relatively quickly. Uh, that means we have to think hard about what the ideal is. What is the ideal that we want to converge towards uh, as, uh, as we implement an algorithm in decision-making? Um, this, this requires background knowledge of social settings in which the algorithm uh, will be used. Uh, a recent article by uh, Selbst and Boyd and others uh, talks about um, the, the framing trap uh, don't frame the, the, the question of uh, fairness so narrowly that you only look at the, at the, at the computer. Look at the whole system. Um, what do you know about how people uh, react to information? Uh, 
uh, how they interpret information, how they act on information. We also need ethical deliberation about what counts as optimal benefit to stakeholders. And this is where we need to go back to that list of different theories of distributive justice in healthcare and think uh, and, and theorize about what the ideal case is. Um, and uh, we also, I think, need empirical, a different kind of empirical work where we do controlled empirical studies um, of, of use cases. So not just run, run your algorithm on your training set, but uh, compare different algorithms um, in their actual settings and see what the effect is on, uh, on, on people's lives. Um, and before I conclude, I want to give a, a kind of very simplistic, um, but perhaps il illustrative example of what I mean by idealizing. Um, take the risk of heart disease. Um, there are various um, 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 gaps or, or um, in this case, gender-based differences associated with the risk of health of heart disease. Um, uh, for, once, for one thing, women are, are known to be underdiagnosed with, with heart disease. And part of the reason is that uh, the doctors uh, uh, often uh, wrongly think that women are somehow um, uh, protected against heart disease. Um, another uh, gender-based gap is that women are underrepresented in clinical trials uh, when it comes to, say, evaluating the effectiveness of treatment for heart disease. So there's just less data. Uh, the data is not representative, not generalizable across genders. And another uh, um, gender um, difference is that men at younger ages are more susceptible to heart disease. Now, when you try to idealize, think about the, 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 your measurement, the target variable, uh, the risk of heart disease, you have to ask yourself, in what world do I want to measure the risk of heart disease? Um, and possibly your, your answer is, well, I want to measure it in a world where women are not underdiagnosed and where women are represented equally in clinical trials. So I, I do want to idealize these two, but I probably don't want to idealize uh, the, the last um, variable, the last discrepancy, gender discrepancy. I do want to take into account uh, the fact that men at younger ages are more susceptible because, because this is part of the phenomenon that I'm trying to, to model. So notice that in order to idealize, you have to engage in, uh, in value-laden uh, questions. Uh, measurement, measurement specification is a value-laden and context-specific task. Uh, it's not something you can just uh, slap a bunch of uh, uh, conditional probabilities on. Uh, it requires theorying about the social uh, and, and medical, in this case, situation in hand. So what have I tried to say today? Um, what I'm hoping this work will become is a kind of uh, framework for responsible measurement, a framework of responsible measurement for machine learning, uh, and specifically in healthcare. Um, this is something that I'm still developing, um, but I want to mention just four quick take home messages uh, that I've tried to urge today. And I'd be very, very uh, interested to know what you think. The first thing, uh, think of locating machine learning algorithms as, uh, as measuring instruments. So those, those machine learning algorithms that I've called locating algorithms, um, um, it may be beneficial to, uh, to tap on, onto the, the methodological and conceptual richness of metrology and philosophy of measurement uh, uh, in order to refine our ideas about, um, about accuracy and error, but about other things that I didn't have time to cover today, such as uh, calibration, stand, uh, uh, standardization, um, uh, traceability of uncertainty, and other, uh, I think, very useful concepts for measurement that I think will be relevant. The second take home message is, um, if you want to measure responsibly, you need to specify the measurement, the, the, the target, uh, according to the purpose of use, not according to the labels you happen to have in your data. Um, third, you need to model and predict the long-term use cases of your, um, of your algorithm, not 
just the patterns in the data that you have in the in the training set or in the validation and test sets. But uh, what you need to predict is, a, is an entire social technical uh, system to borrow, borrow the, the term from STS. Uh, and finally, what you need is to evaluate accuracy uh, um, relative to ethically and epistemically ideal use cases. Now you have to deliberate about what these ideal use cases are and accuracy should, should be evaluated relative to those ideal use cases, uh, not relative to real use cases, which, which may be biased. Uh, so before I, I uh, conclude, I just wanna thank uh, my, my two wonderful students, Yasmin Haddad and, and Lubomir Rechevic, who I think are uh, in the audience. Um, for helping me uh, think about these topics. Um, uh, I also want to thank the Canada Researcher Program for uh, uh, funding this research. And I, um, I welcome you to contact me um, if there are further questions that we won't cover in the discussion period. I very much look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron, uh, for this talk. It was... Uh... Uh, insightful, I should say. Uh, a new way of looking to uh, to algorithms and uh, some proposals to uh, to better their uh, capacity to predict or measure. It depends on how you look at them. Um, so I want to uh, leave uh, a chance for the audience to uh, ask some question and uh, discuss with you the the topics you uh, yeah. introduced us to. Daniel, should I leave my slides up? Uh, yeah, why not? Maybe some of uh, okay. Someone will uh, will uh, lead you to one or, or another of your slides. So and do um, we do we have? I can't remember. Do we have till two fifteen? We have till two. Oh, only till two. Sorry, my mistake. No, no, it's all right. Well, till two. If if it uh, if it goes beyond two, we can uh, st still talk. It's no problem. But usually. Okay. Uh, um, classes at UCAM begins at two, so maybe that uh, some people will leave us uh, to, okay. some class, to be in the virtual classrooms. Um, alors, c'est le, le, le moment de la période de questions. Je vous rappelle uh, que des questions peuvent être posées directement en anglais pour uh, favoriser la discussion avec uh, le conférencier. Si uh, vous souhaitez les poser en français, on va s'arranger pour les traduire adéquatement. Euh, on ne pourra pas faire les interprètes là, pour la, la réponse de, de Aaron Tal, ce serait un peu fastidieux. Donc, je vous invite à ouvrir votre caméra, lever la, la main, euh, inscrire une question dans le chat. Vous avez différentes manières de, de le faire. Donc, est-ce qu'il y en a qui auraient des questions ou des sujets dont ils voudraient discuter? No one. Oh, so there is one question in the a question in the, in the chat. chat. So do you want to? Okay. Should we still consider machine learning as a work in progress instead of trying to persuade ourselves that we are already ready with artificial intelligence? It's from Jean Noël Berube. Oh, thanks very very much, uh, Jean Noël. Um, uh, so that there are two parts to to my answer. One is that um, uh, in in as far as we're talking about artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is a, is a hype uh, kind of term. Um, um, there are various discussions about whether general artificial intelligence that is human-like or maybe superior to that of humans uh, will come out of recent re research and, and work in artificial intelligence. Um, um, I'm I'm not really concerned with with that uh, aspect, but those those who think that we are heading towards um, out of general artificial intelligence think that we're, what we have now is definitely just work in progress uh, on the route to um, to something like more like human intelligence. I I don't think anyone uh, of note in the field thinks that we're there. Um, but there's another more, more modest way in which uh, I think machine learning, even relative to a more modest standard than uh, you know, average human intelligence, machine learning is still work in progress. Uh, 
in the sense that um, uh, the, the field hasn't uh, um, yet uh, stabilized some of its most base, basic methodological questions, such as how do we evaluate performance? Uh, what counts as a successful implementation? Um, how do we um, um, how, how do we balance uh, technical uh, um, uh, constraints with social ones? Um, and and as I've uh, as I've uh, I've tried to um, to claim um, even the question of what what are we measuring? You know what are we evaluating? What are predictions? What is the target viable? Even those questions are still in flux. Um, people are are uh, publishing papers right now about um, various biases um, uh, that affect labels and and features in the data. Um, so I would say, machine learning right now is probably where thermometry was uh, uh, 200 years ago. Um, if you read Hasek Chang's book about inventing temperature, we're, we're more or less in the 1820s uh, when, where, where, where thermometry was in the 1820s um, is my kind of way of, way of thinking about it. Um, so yes, machine learning has a very long way to go. The, the challenge is that um, regardless of, of how long it has to go, it's already being used and it's used to make uh, high stakes decisions about us, about our lives, about which loans will, will be approved for, about um, this, the sentencing for criminal justice, about, um, um, about the medical resources that will be allocated to, to, to patients, um, um, about whether someone is more or less likely to be diagnosed with a condition. Um, so, um, even though perhaps from an ethical perspective, one may, might want to hold, up, hold off our horses and wait till the technology is somehow better before implementing it, um, practical and financial uh, considerations are such that uh, these, these tools are already in use. Thank you. Is there another question? Anyone? Okay, I have one for you. Uh, oh, Yasmin Adad, go ahead. So, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so, uh, I really enjoyed the talk, Aaron. Um, and my question is uh, it got me thinking when you were talking about error in, in measurement. And um, I just wanted to ask, it's more a measurement related question. So is there like a single concept of error that applies to measurement in general? Or would there be, you know, different kinds of, of um, measures of error itself? And if so, if there are many, is there one specific one that would work better for uh, conceptualizing error in classification tasks, for example? What's the last bit? Uh, is that would be more relevant? Is there, if there are more, like if there are lots of different ways of thinking about error in measurement, is there one in specific that would be more helpful than others uh, to apply, let's say, in classification tasks? For okay, great. Learning? Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, so the the concept of measurement error is is varied. Um, uh, one more uh, kind of more metaphysical way of thinking about measurement error is in terms of the difference between um, your your outcome and the truth, right? If if the length of something is really four centimeters, but you evaluate it as five, then your error is one. Um, um, the this is a a, a limited uh, methodologically limited notion of error uh, because. Um, you usually don't have access to the true value, or you may, you know, some some philosophers even doubt that there are true values, um, uh, without without some kind of measurement. Uh, so you're if you're trying to evaluate accuracy relative to to the truth, you often uh, find yourself in a kind of uh, uh, vicious circle. Um, 
the notion of error that I've, I've been talking about in this talk, although I haven't um, explicitly stated it, is a more epistemic notion of error, also known as bias, which is error relative um, to um, the, the theoretical ideal. Um, what, what you take from a theoretical perspective to be the best uh, estimate um, of, of a measurement value. And there are various ways to, to evaluate uh, uh, error or bias uh, relative to theoretical ideal. Um, and another important distinction is between random and systematic error. Um, so within the, the epistemic notion of error, um, we can talk about random error, which is the error that happens when you repeat a process again and again, and there's a kind of distribution Let's say you, you read the thermometer and then you measure the same thing again, you read the thermometer, thermometer again, there's gonna be a distribution of indications. Uh, you're not gonna get exactly the same result every time you measure the same thing. Um, and those are known as random errors because they arise from uncontrolled um, variations to the procedure or to, or to the thing that you're measuring. Um, what I've concentrated here on, on in this talk and what I think is especially important to, uh, to consider in the case of uh, classification, uh, machine-based classification, uh, is uh, systematic errors. Those are errors that are, do not vary from uh, under repeated applications of the measurement. Uh, they, they stay the same. And to discover those, you need to compare different measuring instruments to each other. And you need to use theory to predict, to, to theorize about what, what could be going wrong with your measurement um, that makes it um, deviate from, uh, from ideal conditions. Um, the, the reason I think systematic errors are especially relevant is because uh, what's, what I think is missing right now in uh, much of the discussion of accuracy and machine learning is, a, is an explicit consideration of what the ideal conditions are. What, in what kind of world do I want to measure? Uh, let's go back to that slide. In what kind of world do I want to measure the risk of heart, heart disease? Uh, I don't want to, I, ideally, what I want to measure is the risk of heart disease in a world where women are not underdiagnosed and where, where women are uh, not are underrepresented in clinical trials. So. I have a systematic error. My, my current machine learning bias, let, let's say that there's a machine learning uh, algorithm that predicts risk of heart disease. Um, if, I, if I use my current data, then my labels, the diagnosis I use from, from actual physicians uh, will have women underdiagnosed and the data will, will have a, a small portion of women in it. Uh, so the, the algorithm will be biased. But what I want to know is biased by how much? What is the systematic error? If I can predict that systematic error, um, if I can tell by how much are these factors biasing my prediction, then I can correct the estimate and, uh, and evaluate the risk of heart disease in that ideal world. But that requires knowing a lot about uh, the healthcare system, and uh, and uh, you know about and about health, about physiology, about coronary heart disease. Um, so, just like we use theory to correct the clock, uh, we can use you know social and 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 uh, social theory and, and 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 physiology to correct our predictions. Uh, so the, the focus is here on, on systematic errors. Thank you. Do you have something you wanted to add, uh, Yasmin? No, no, that was super clear. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, is there another question? So the one I have for you is it's about uh, the so there are biases from the labels that you you uh, you use for the classification, but 
I guess that there is a margin of error that comes from the data that you put in the machine uh, to train it and to uh, measure its accuracy. For example, if you feed it with 100 pictures of a, a melanoma, but just only one is, is, is a cancer melanoma, so it, and it doesn't detect that picture as a, a, a possible cancer, then its accuracy is still 99%. Yeah, and and so this is really thank, thanks a lot, Daniel. This this is an interesting um, uh, question that has to do uh, with how representative your data uh, is of the um, of the phenomenon that you are trying to uh, to evaluate. Um, um, the there are several forms of of uh, of biases um, that could affect the training data for an algorithm. Um, one of them that I mentioned is uh, is label bias. When your um, when your algorithm is trying to assess one thing, but your labels are about another thing. Uh, sometimes some some proxy. Um, and I and I mentioned, for example. Uh, um, uh, death rates is a proxy for benefit of, of treatment. Those are two different things, uh, and they could go in, in opposite directions. Um, another kind uh, is simply uh, sampling uh, uh, biases. Um, if if the, the space that you're sampling in your data is uh, not representative of the, the, the space that you're, you're, you want to learn about, uh, that's a problem. If, if for example, um, um, malignant tumors are underrepresented in your data, and you're trying to uh, to predict whether it, a, a tumor is malignant, uh, you have a problem. But even if you have a, a good sampling of, say, both uh, um, uh, benign and malignant, uh, say, skin le lesions, you still have the problem of uh, a, a more subtle problem of rep different demographics. Uh, again, if you look at this, uh, this slide that I already have on, if you look at the, at the center mm -hmm. uh, 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 case, the fact that women are underrepresented in clinical trials or in, or in your data set means that, you know, let's say 80% of the, um, um, of, of the the chest X-rays in your in your database are from men, and only twenty are from women. And assuming that there are physiological differences that are relevant to uh, the diagnosis between men and women, then you're going to have higher error rates um, because of this sampling uh, error. You're going to have higher error rates of, of predicting the risk of heart disease. Uh, with a machine learning algorithm, because your sample is is biased, does that answer your question? Yeah. So, so you have to be to feed it the right thing, and to to uh, to comp compensate the biases, like the under representations of uh, women in clinical trials, with like overfeeding the the algorithm with uh, women cases. I guess you you, so that, you that have would, to do uh, that. Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. No, go you, ahead. You, you have you have to do that, or if you have a way of predicting what the yeah. uh, the correct outcome is, yeah, of course, uh, then you 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 can come up with a with a with a theoretically driven um, way of uh, of correcting the bias post hoc. Now mm -hmm. this is still a simple example because it's not those examples here on this slide are not um, they don't unfold over time. They're, they're static. Uh, what happens when, um, uh, in in, the, in in cases such as a predictive policing, when um, when um, um, designating a neighborhood as high crime rate uh, uh, leads to more police presence, more arrests, and therefore more 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 uh, a crime rate uh, predicted by the algorithm? Now we have a uh, um, a, a, a diachronic, uh, unfolding kind of 
um, self-fulfilling prophecy, a bias that is, uh, that is ballooning um, in the data. Um, so um, part, of, uh, part of what I think of as accuracy is the ability to predict um, and correct for also these diachron diachronic effects, not just the syn synchronic effects in a given data at a given time, but also diachronic effects. Would you describe as also a, um, you know, an, another form of bias as of uh, the solution will, how could I say? So if you predict that there is more crime in, in uh, one neighborhood, then you put more you put more policemen in it and then they do more arrests and et cetera. So the solution to more crime is not putting more police, you know? So it's, it, it's, a bi it's another bias, but at the end of the line. So yeah. you're not applying the right solution to the right problem. That's right. And this is, this is why I think um, we need to talk about, uh, we need to specify the, the target variable or the measurement um, relative to the, the purpose of the, the use. Um, we need to deliberate about what we're measuring for, what we're, we're what we're predicting for. Um, the, the the there's a lot of hype about around machine learning. Um, in the early years, it was thought that simply because this is a computer, it's going to be free of bias, and therefore we can simply um, use it. And it's going to give us objective. Uh, results because it's not a human, it's a machine and therefore it's objective. But of course, the data itself is, is, uh, is rich with our own, uh, with our own injustices um, and biases and, and the algorithm simply replicates those. Um, um, but um, part, of, uh, part of the way of, of um, tackling these uh, these issues of, of unfairness is to uh, is to deliberate about what we want to uh, to measure and whether there's a fitness between what we what we're measuring and the decision making we're basing on it. Um, in this case, in the case of predictive policing, there's a mismatch between what we're measuring, which is the rate of arrests, and the decision making we're making, which is where to send police. Uh, the, we're, we're measuring the wrong variable for that type of decision. Um, so this is a case where, uh, and, and there are interesting models that try to correct, that try to measure something else. Uh, um, for example, through simulating uh, the, the, the behavior of police and um, and their response to the algorithm and, and uh, incorporating the, the, the predictions of that simulation back into the prediction. So now you're not no longer just predicting arrest, you're predicting a, a complex social, social behavior um, that counteracts the, the, the feedback loop. So we are making a, a great plea for uh, uh, SSH scientifics to work with the uh, Informaticians that do machine learning and develop these uh, these uh, systems, so yeah, that they, they can they can predict uh, these uh, these biases and uh, uh, and and do a background on the on the context in which these uh, these artificial intelligences are are used. Yeah, and the the Zelps article that I mentioned uh, is an example of exactly uh, is is exactly that kind of plea. I I. I I completely agree with that. We need, we need uh, social scientists, uh, you know, psychologists, behavioral economic, e e um, economists, uh, health policy um, um, experts, and ethicists. Uh, they all need to be at the table when when we decide what to uh, what to measure. And of course, stakeholders themselves. Um, it has to be a participatory type of of deliberation. Great. Est-ce qu'il est qu y a d'autres questions pour euh, Erantal? No? So we've, we've reached our two o'clock uh, time limit. <laughs> uh, it was great to have you uh, today. I think you gave us uh, uh, lots of uh, material to think about in the next days. And 
Yeah, thank you. That was very informative. It was indeed. So, thank you very, very much. I, I really enjoyed presenting to you and I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to Sirst. If anyone has a question that they were too shy to ask, please feel free to email me. All right, great. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, thank and you. Uh, have a good Friday afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>